Even men at the top of their game find themselves wanting more from life, whether it's more meaning, unshakable confidence, a bigger impact, more money, deeper love, a hotter sex life, or a powerful legacy. Find out how good your life can be on this episode of Man Alive. Also, as I've supported men in their love and work lives for 15 years now, many men ask for the right words to say to be more successful, attractive, and desirable. But I found it's not so simple as giving scripts or lines because every man is different. So giving words or scripts would be like giving a tall, thin man a shorter, wider man's pants or vice versa. The words have to make sense for you and your personality, and there's so much happening beneath the surface that people are responding to. If you're interested in how to become a better lover and leader in your own unique way, go to shanajamescoaching.com slash quiz, or you can text ALIVE to 44144. It only takes a couple minutes and you'll start to get an idea of how you can be both more respected and desired. After you fill it out, we can schedule a time to review your quiz and talk about your specific challenges and desires. So again, go to either shanajamescoaching.com slash quiz or text ALIVE to 44144. That's A-L-I-V-E to 44144. Enjoy this episode of Man Alive. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Man Alive. I'm your host, Shana James. Happy to be here today to talk about fatherhood. So as a parent, fathering and, you know, parenthood, fatherhood, parenthood is one of the things nearest and dearest to my heart. And whenever I get to support men who are fathers, uh, there's this exponential sense of, you know, feeling honored and feeling like, oh, I get to support not only this man in his journey, but also his children and children's children and right, like the generations that come after. So I'm really excited to talk about fatherhood today. And we have an amazing guest who just wrote a book called Fathering Together, Living a Connected Dad Life. And we're going to talk about new narratives around fatherhood. And so thank you so much, Brian, for being here, Brian Anderson, and uh, really excited to have you. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. And always a pleasure to talk with you, no matter the topic. So looking forward thank to it. You. Thank you. So, all right, why don't we do a little bit of how you got into, you know, what what inspired you to write this book? Yeah, my father journey started eight and a half years ago when my first daughter was born. And I looked around and my wife had all of these mom support groups in person, Facebook, you name it. I remember she all those mommy groups. And, yeah, <laughs> yeah, there are lots of them and they're great. And, you know, for every 10,000 mom groups, there's one or two dad groups. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and the few that I could find were not really for me and kind of the leanings that I wanted to have in my new role as father. And so like any good person, I just decided to make one, but <laughs> the, that, you know, easier said than done. Yeah, right? I was going to say like, so any it good was person, just, right? yeah. Right. So me and my neighbors started meeting every couple of months at a bar, just talking about life, fatherhood, whatever. And then my friend Chris co-founded this group called Dads with Daughters on Facebook, and that just exploded. And our focus there was really with understanding that none of us have all the answers, but we can lean on each other and kind of use this as a support mm, group. Nice. And I love that, that none of us have all the answers and that's okay. That's like, that's human, totally okay. that's, right? There's nothing wrong with that. Cause I think men are so often taught, gotta have all the answers. Gotta have all the answers. You ne never ask for directions. All those kind of like stereotypical yeah. things that our, our past generations have kind of handed down to us that in some ways, you know, there's some that definitely are helpful, but a lot of them are just really not helpful. And mm -hmm. through more formal conversations, as the book started really taking off, but mostly through informal kind of research, if you will, I realized most dads who were doing things, quote unquote, the right way, were kind of using the skills that they gained in their professional lives through mm -hmm. this idea of servant leadership and caring for our family, much like they are supposed to quote unquote care for their coworkers and teams so that they can be more productive. Now okay, families you, aren't can supposed you, to- Can you just pause for the, um, go back to the doing it the right way. Can you describe like, what, what do you see as the right way? Yeah, I think for me, and this is what I spell out in, in my book, is how are dads connecting with their kids, not just serving as financial providers, Okay, right? And yep. I know my dad 
had that mindset and I was very lucky in the early eighties to have a dad who was flipping the script, but yeah. my grandfather, other relatives I had, all of them had this idea that I need to work 40, 50, 60 hours a week. I don't need to be present in the home because that's the wife's job. That's the mom's job. I just need to make sure that my family is financially secure. Yeah. And that's a great start. I'm not going to fault any man or father for thinking that's where they come from. Cause I, I mean, I have those pressures, right? We all yeah, need to, we all need to keep a roof over our heads, but, but my daughters make it very clear that they don't care what my job is. They're interested, right? right? They want to know, yeah. but they want me to be here for the Lego building, the Barbie sh- the house making right. the game nights, all that stuff that builds that emotional piggy bank and mm-hmm. overflows it. I love it. I love it for adults. It's a bank account and for the kids, right? Is that that piggy bank? It's like, those are the things that are really important to them and that shape and nurture them to know they are loved, they are supported, they are connected. Right. Right. And as I was talking with dads, many of them gave me two responses when it came to fatherhood. One is I want to do everything opposite of what my dad did because he was never present. He never did X, Y, Z. Or they said, I have to live up to this amazing ideal that my dad left me. And I don't know if I'll do it in this modern age. Ooh, both and of those are a lot of pressure. Both of them are a lot of pressure. And for me, you know, as I, as I study, you know, the cultural landscape of modern masculinity and toxic masculinity and all these alpha males, omega males, all these different, you know, like whatever pop cultural references. Yeah. I realized there's just so many unfair expectations, but the healthy expectations come with quote unquote, you know, as I put in my book title, fathering together. How do we shift our mindset from I have to do this on my own and uh. figure things out to Hey, my neighbor is, and and really in real life, my neighbor is an expert at tech, right? Like he has all the gadgets. He knows how to code. I don't know any of those things. Yeah. And so I ask him questions all the time and he's not good with carpentry. He's not good with like handyman stuff. So he's asking me like, Hey, this thing broke in my house. How, how can do I, I do this? figure it out? Yeah. Right. And so in a sense, like we're leaning on each other all the time and you know, our uh-huh. kids are in the same activities. So sometimes I'll take all the kids or I'll be like, Hey, I had this thing come up. Can you watch my daughters for a sec? Right? Like there's a community around us that we so often forget is going through the same journey. And yeah. so why can't we bake that into fatherhood mm-hmm. and lean on one another, not just our fellow fathers, but also lean on, on our partners our and to some extent, our children, our children don't have manuals. We have to co-create those manuals with them. Oh my God. And I, I'm sure like you, I read all sorts of books early on in fatherhood, parenthood. Right. And then you see, what to do. oh my gosh, that doesn't fit for my kids. And they don't fit, <laughs> right, right. And chances are, if you're a parent with multiple kids, whatever your strategies for the first one were and continue to be, don't they're not going to apply to the second one. one. No. Or it's a slight shift, right? You got to do a version 0.1 or 0.5, right? So, uh, for me, fathering together became this way of life of how am I co-creating who I am in relationship with everyone around me mm-hmm. and using this idea of servant leadership that I was picking up in all these conversations, how do I have the mindset that I'm serving those around me, creating opportunities for growth and exploration, much like a really good supervisor does for their staff, right? Like, okay. Yeah. I want to dive work- into that more like the okay, servant sorry. leadership piece. Cause no, it's good. This is good. I want to go where you're going, which is like, all right. So when I hear the word servant leadership, I'm not as familiar with that term. And so for those who don't really know, okay, where did that come from? What is it? And how are you applying it? You started yeah. to go there, but let's dive in deeper. Happy to dive in more. So the short version is Robert Greenleaf business leader in the sixties was struggling trying to figure out a new way to make his business profitable, make his life more meaningful. Read a book by Herman Hess, who's got all these oh, you know, great books out there in the world and realized this one book, Journey to the East, mm-hmm. the main character and the most important character was not the British naval officer that was out to conquer the world, but the servant leader who was the cook and Sherpa that was carrying all their gear, making sure meals were ready, the tents were prepared, yeah. and kind of flipped the idea of leadership back in the 60s on its head to say true leadership is not being a you know, a loud mouth laying out a here's exactly what we need to do and no one can deviate to instead, if I want to be a successful CEO, 
my staff need to be successful so that I can sing our praises to our board, to investors, to whomever yeah. is looking at us. And for me, I was like, great, I, I'll do that in the, my professional life. But I had a, co- a couple of conversations where I was like, what if this applies to fatherhood, yes. right? Like, what if me as a father is not about dictating the life of my child, but instead right. just creating opportunities for them to thrive? And mm-hmm. Both my dad and my father-in-law get some credit. My dad for living that without telling me and creating opportunities for myself. Yeah. And then my father-in-law, when we first told you know all the relatives we were going to have our first child, I asked him any advice. And he's a man of few words in some respects. And he goes, I'm not going to tell you. Like, you're not my kid. I'm not going to tell you what to do. No. All I'll tell you is make sure you expose your child to as many opportunities as possible. That's the only advice I'm going to give That was the only advice he was willing to give you? And obviously that's over the years that's shifted a bit, but right. it's really and I'm sure he's through. led by example and you know, all the oh, other things. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, my wife is amazing and constantly, you know, exploring life for herself. And I see, you know, their interactions. And he's always kind of very Socratic in his way of asking mm-hmm. my wife, like, well, what did you think about that? And my dad was similar with me. And so I just kind of again, started making these connections that I couldn't find anywhere else. There were a few blog posts on fatherhood and servant leadership or parenthood and servant leadership, but they were very Christian oriented or very, very narrow focused and definitely no books. And I said, okay, well, I can't fall asleep because I'm always thinking about this. I guess I need to write this book and and evolve what we were doing at Fathering Together from a virtual support group system to something more meaningful and more scalable, if you will. Yeah. 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 Okay. So servant leadership. So you started to go into this as a father, right? How can you give us some examples? How are you applying servant leadership in your fathering? Yeah. So it's not a direct translation, right? Like no metaphor is perfect, but in, in the servant leadership model, there's a lot of how are you forecasting the future and making decisions that will create opportunities that will allow your staff to meet those demands uh, that you see in the future. And how are you using empathy and emotional intelligence to better understand your employees Mm -hmm. and how they tick so that you're not giving them a job that they're going to fail at, but one that they're going to thrive at. Uh, And then just, again, communication and um, advocating for their needs. All of that is baked into servant leadership. There's there's a lot of more. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, the whole laundry list of things that people have pointed out over the years that I won't get into. Um, But for, for my daughters, I just started thinking about like, okay, as we were just saying, they don't really care what I do for a living. They care that I'm around Mm -hmm. and I can't be active and engaged if I don't understand who they are and what they love doing. Mm -hmm. And to that extent, like my eldest loves school, loves learning every day. She gets a test she comes home excited that she got to be <laughs> tested. And, and my youngest amazing. is not that way at all. She's more artsy. She loves performing. And I can tell she's going to struggle in the next couple of years because of what my what my eldest has thrived in yeah. is going to really challenge my youngest. And so how can I know that about them? How do I emotionally invest in them so that when they come home having a bad day, I don't write them off Mm -hmm. or I don't shortchange that emotion that they're going through, but I acknowledge that and communicate that acknowledgement in a way they'll hear. Um, But then also how do I advocate for them? Right? Like they're both girls. They're going to grow up to be women. Mm -hmm. uh, As far as I can tell. I was going to say uh, (laughs) possibly. Right. (laughs) Right. Yeah. You you never quite know. Um, And I, I want them to have every opportunity that they can. And when I was first holding my my first daughter, all of the statistics that I know about women and sexual violence flooded my brain because I've I've been involved in some of those gender-based violence workshops in the past. And and I made a decision. I could be a dad that could just say, all right, the status quo is there's a chance you're going to be raped. I'm just going to prepare you for that. Yeah. Or I could be proactive and start helping shift the mindset of everyone in the world to say, hey, maybe women should be treated as equals. Maybe we shouldn't victimize people and change the language of how we treat women in the workplace and the home, et cetera. Yeah. And and that and so I obviously chose the latter. And 
bake that into fathering together and the gender equity work we're doing. And so how then am I not just advocating for her professional growth, but also her livelihood and yes. her, the challenges and obstacles that she's going to face that other people, her friends might face. Um, how can I work as a father to mitigate those, those mm. obstacles? And she's so fortunate. They're so fortunate to have you as a dad. <laughs> I, I pay on comparison to some, I, I, you know, a lot of what I'm sharing is uh, original thought. A lot of it is, you know, in concert, in conversation with all these amazing other leaders. Sure. I think that's how and it be, right? I will just say, right, like the depth of your care and your heart and your devotion and your dedication and your action, you know, not everybody does that. Fair enough. I will, I will, Thank you. I will take credit where credit is due and also sing the praises of so many other great dads and moms out there, parents in general that are just doing amazing work to, yeah, shift the status quo away yeah. from, yeah, it's just how it is to, how do we, how do we serve our children by creating new systems that have them at the center, have other people centered in what looks like success, what looks like leadership uh, so that we're not just, you know, adhering to a model that is outdated for so many people yeah. and i think in many respects fatherhood needs some updating right like yeah. so many opportunities for moms have been in the home traditionally right and serving the community in different ways no problem with it, no shame no judgment but the flip side of that is men are forced to work in that mm -hmm. model. And when I first met my wife, she made more money than me, had a better career in front of her and didn't want to be that stay at home mom. Like mm -hmm. obviously wanted to be home at times and, and yeah. be there for our children in the same way I wanted to be, but to, to focus as once as the only solution is me to work and her to stay home is to shortchange her career objectives, shortchange our financial future and there are so many parents that I've met that have that opportunity where the mom, the partner is a doctor and the other person is not <laughs> or or any number of financial uh, gains in one side and not. And so to, to just have these answers for what a family needs to look like is just holding all of us back. Yeah. I mean, I know some amazing dads who either work less or, you know, do more of the childcare than the moms. And it just, I think it's, it's beautiful. It's powerful. You know, I think the kids who end up having more of that fathering energy, there's, they just feel really balanced and loved and supported. And so I love breaking down, right. Okay. This is, you know, we've been fed this image of most things, what family has to look like, what relationships look like, what love looks like, what sex looks like, what all, you know? And so I love that you're breaking down that, okay, this is not, we don't have to take the, the cookie cutter mold. Like who are right. you as a dad? Who do you want to be, um, you know, releasing the shame and actually having more pride and more of a sense of, yes, this is what I stand for. Yeah. Well, and I love what, um, the title of your podcast, right? Man Alive, like what helps you feel alive? What yeah. allows you to feel alive? And mm -hmm. as a dad, if if you just know, I want to be a stay-at-home dad, I want to be there and raise my children, why can't you have that opportunity? Yeah. And, and if that is what's going to happen, why should your wife have less of an opportunity to excel in the workplace? Yeah. It, it just seems ridiculous to me. And as you're alluded, alluding to, like, the more our children soak up the information around them and the only information is dad's emotionally distant and makes money, right. that creates a paradigm for them to seek out in the future. Right. And it's not intellectual money. information. It's like right. that, right? That felt emotional information, that the field right. of how they're cared for and loved. Right. I had one dad I interviewed say, I had to perform to get my dad to notice me and show me attention and yeah. any sort of affection, which meant I tried to do well in sports and that failed because he's not athletic. So then he shifted to, you know, performance art and musical theater and things like that. And that didn't necessarily fit the same definition mm. of manhood, but it was at least something. Yeah. And, and that's tragic, right? Like my dad came home early to make dinner because my mom's hours were that she worked into the evening a bit more. Yeah. I have so many memories of my dad just coming home and making dinner and I don't, I mean, 
maybe my therapist can tell me this more definitively, but <laughs> I'm the cook in our house, right? Like, uh -huh. I don't know, like, did that just spur an interest in cooking? Cause that's what I always saw my dad doing, even though he's also a master carpenter and can build some really cool stuff that I didn't get those genetic codes for. Mm -hmm. My sister got those. So again, mm -hmm. uh, you know, picking up on those emotional cues and those emotional memories are creating who I am as an adult, whether I like it or not. And I think Amazing. the more, again, the more diversity of experiences we can give our children, the more that they have to draw from, from for their resiliency, for their career yes. ambitions, for all of those, once yeah. they become into those teenage years and those formative experiences. So awesome. Get out there, experience life. Yeah. Love it. Is there anything else you want to say about the new narrative of fatherhood or anything we've, we've missed in the, the overview of it? Yeah. One thing I spell out in the book that isn't quite servant leadership, but uh, I kind of label as the pre-work. I was interviewing a lot of dads who mentioned going to therapy, doing counseling with their partners, going on spiritual retreats to kind of recenter themselves for this epic change. And then I was interviewing dads that didn't do any of that and didn't really prepare beyond like going to a baby kind of change diaper class or the Maz or, you know, some of those yeah. kind of hospital oriented things that are yeah. semi required by hospitals for couples to go to. And it was fascinating how many of the ones that didn't do any pre-work still struggled four or mm. five years in yeah. and not necessarily with connecting with their child, even though that was present, but connecting with themselves and mm -hmm. understanding what they wanted out of life. Now that there's this new pressure and new responsibility, yep. whereas those that had taken some of that time to better understand, okay, what skills do I have in the workplace versus in the home? Yep. What yep. do I want out of life? What kind of dad do I want to be? Uh, for those that were more religious, what does my Christian or Muslim tradition or you name it, faith tradition, how is that informing my view of my role? Mm -hmm. All of that stuff feels very foreign yeah. in, in kind of the corporate world of like money, 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 or work, work, work. And yet for those that took the time, they're just feeling so much more fulfilled. They're, they're alive, right. Yeah. With who they want to be and what they want for their children. And so biggest piece of advice I tell any father as they start this journey is how are you doing that deep work for yourself? How mm -hmm. are you getting to know who you are? as an entity in and of themselves, because so many of us men are taught to do and, and have a role yeah. rather than simply be. And when, when we simply be, sometimes that can be scary, but if we take some time to get used to that, we can just be with our child then, right? Just sit and cuddle and have them on our chest, which is so awesome for all of you that are parents, you know, like the one-year-old cuddle on your chest oh is one God, of the best feelings in the snow. world. Yeah. But if you can't just calmly sit, that's going to be a struggle, right? You're going to feel like you're totally. missing out. No, I've I worked with to... a lot of men who like, you know, because of the programming, it takes something to actually be able to slow down and be there in those moments instead of just like, bam, 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 or I'm going to coach your softball team, you know, all these things that are, or baseball team, whatever it is, all these things are amazing. And right. To be able to actually slow down, to feel you know, if you're not feeling alive in yourself, then when you slow down, you have to face all the muck that comes up. And even right. if you are feeling alive in yourself, there's still, you know, muck that comes up, but it's like, you're more likely to be able to slow down and actually be present and be there with your kids and, and then get nourished yourself. I mean, that's one of my favorite things too, working with men and dads is like, okay, how do you get nourished by fathering by parenting as opposed to constantly being drained by it yeah yeah and life is a journey right like i remember you know olympians being interviewed saying you have to love the journey and the training you don't because the olympics is a split second split in the second life of done and, yeah and if you don't enjoy the long hours in the pool or on the track or skiing down a slope, then you why compete, right? right? And some of that is true for fatherhood. Like if you have the mindset of like, I got to get through these 18 years, yeah, then, then you're really going to live a sad it's, existence. You're going to suffer. But if you get to rejoice <laughs> and relive your own childhood through the eyes of your kids to pull yeah. out that box of Legos that you saved like I did to rebuild uh, and and 
be able to say, you know what, my daughter is going to create these in a way that I never would and be mm -hmm. okay with it. Mm -hmm. Even though I remember how I used to build them. Right. Like yeah. that's a lot of joy can be found there. If we allow ourselves to be present in those moments, rather than always be thinking about how does this build towards the next thing? Yeah. You definitely want to have those thoughts, but not every event has to build on every yeah. event. Right. Yeah. Love it. Any last thing you want to say or anything that you're most excited about or inspired about in the book that you want men to go read? I think, you know, for me, it was really important to get a diversity of experiences and dads who have walked all sorts of pathways to get to fatherhood or had dads who you know, had different experiences. And so there's not any one specific thing, but I will say I wrote the book not to be read cover to cover. Like, okay. Chapters are designed that if if you think you've got your communication down, Pat, feel free to skip that chapter, but read it anyway in the end, because <laughs> like, maybe there's a new, right. a new strategy. Maybe there's a new insight or a new practice. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So don't feel like you have to read it front to back. If you want to jump around and, and work on certain skills, uh, you know, go for it. And we are actually going to be put, producing a workbook next week, uh, week after oh, awesome. uh, that kind of builds on the narratives and, and the stories that some of these men went through so that it's not just here's a cool story, but also like here are those questions you should be asking yourself or yes. here's how to map out that deep work, as I mentioned earlier. For yourself. Awesome. Well, thank you for being a devoted and loving and committed father and for you know, guiding other men and helping men realize, okay, I don't have to do this on my own. I don't have to know it all. You know, I get to lean on others and learn from others. And you're, it's like you're recreating the village that feels so missing in most of our lives. Well, thank you. And like a village, I'm not on my own. I've got an amazing co-founder in Chris Lewis. I've got my wife who's more than patient with me, uh, probably more patient than I deserve. And there's just so many other dads out there that are pushing me to think more critically and differently about my own skill set. And so this book would not have existed without all the relationships feeding into it. Uh, and then me just, as you know, sitting down and typing out the words that need to be there. So uh, in the end, it's on <laughs> For us. Thousands and thousands of hours. Yes. <laughs> all those hours. But yeah, so many voices have been channeled through all those hours and yeah. I just want to make sure I thank all of my, my oh, peers on that front. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you. I'm so glad you joined us for today's episode of Man Alive. I hope you enjoyed our conversation and it gave you something to consider and explore in your life. If you like what you heard, I'd be so grateful for you to subscribe and write a quick review that helps men like you find us. And again, head over to shanajamescoaching.com slash quiz or text the word ALIVE, A-L-I-V-E, to 44144 to get a sense of how you can become a better lover and leader. You'll start to see how you can be both more respected and desired in your unique and genuine way. If you don't feel as confident or as excited about life or love as you'd like to be, this quiz is a really great starting point and will guide you toward a more passionate love life and a more inspiring and successful career. So again, text ALIVE, A-L-I-V-E, to 44144 or head over to shanajamescoaching.com slash quiz. Join us each week for a new episode of Man Alive.